Um, I'm going to talk to you all today about the difference between belief and faith. I think most of us see those two terms as being synonymous, one and the same. And biblically, they're not entirely the same. Um, we're going to go over that. And more importantly, I want to tell you what that means for us and, and the amazing advantage that we have because of our faith. I want to start off, though, um, I want all of you, not all of you, but at least a handful, maybe five to ten, to tell me some of your favorite Bible characters and tell me why they're your favorite. So anyone at random. Oh. Right? Tina and Tricosa. <laughs> That's hot, right? I hear the story a lot. Doreen? Joseph. Okay, and why Joseph? Um, because he turned to God through all of his uh, trials. Okay. And at the very end, he announced to his brothers that what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So the Christ figure. Okay. okay. Uh, who else? Solomon. Solomon. Okay, why Solomon? Because he got it with the wisdom. He realized it's all vanity here. Okay. Come on, there's got to be more. Well, there's Mary and Martha. Okay. And Mary, of course, knew the better way, and Martha was very busy, and, and that's just sometimes a battle. Okay. To be a Mary or a Martha. So you kind of relate to it maybe as a, yeah. as a woman? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Tryphosa, my next would be Noah. I really yeah, like that. Okay. Noah. Yeah, I'll go ahead and list Noah. Why Noah? Why Noah? Great faith. The audacity of, of, of the faith. The audacity of hope? Audacity yeah. of the faith. No. Uh, anybody else? Well, I'm looking for some some of the more grand figures, especially. Abraham. I think of. Okay, Abraham. There we go. The father of faith. Yeah. So there, there we go. Like Abraham, uh, you know, he left his country. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. You leave all your relatives, you leave everything you know, and you don't even know where you're going. Yeah. That's a great lesson in itself. Uh, <laughs> because of all the changes that we go through, having no idea what God has in store, and just trusting Him and having that faith. Uh, anybody else? Paul. Oh. Yeah. Well, Paul. Great. Okay. Now, I don't even really need to ask, but why Paul? He was the one that brought this message to us by you know, being the instrument Christ used to get the message to mm -hmm. us. All the suffering that he endured. But I also way. like Paul because he was trained one way and came kicking and screaming yeah. into the new way. You're, you're a modern day identify. You're a modern day Paul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he Martin committed, and Clyde. He committed his message to God even when he died. His message was dying out. He had no idea that 2,000 years after his death would still be Right. That yep. But he didn't know that, so he died in faith. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? This is a pretty good list. I was going for about seven or ten or so. Nobody said Jesus or Job, so. Okay. Job. Well, we're gonna put. We'll just list both of them. Job. Okay. All these. Daniel. Daniel. Jesus. Yep. Faced by lions and didn't. Okay, I want you to take a look at this list for a second. And I want you to think through all the names and their stories, what they've meant to us and our growth in faith. And then I want to tell you something that may rock your world. We, in this room, members of the body of Christ today, are at a greater advantage than all of these men, right. except Christ. He's the exception on this list. We are at a great advantage compared to them, and we are worthy, in God's eyes, of more honor and more blessing, and I'm going to explain to you why. That's probably a pretty startling thing to hear, I'd imagine, because we look up to these men, and we, we want to emulate them, right? I mean... You think, I don't know if I would have had the faith that Abraham had to leave, to be on the brink of killing my son who you know, my wife had when she was barren before. Joseph, 
who after all of the trials that he endured, you remember what all those were? Beaten, sold into slavery by his brothers, um, accused of adultery when he was innocent, um, put in jail because of that, and then in every case, just like Christ, he came out of it because of his faith, had no idea what God's purpose was in it, and the whole purpose was pointing to Christ. Oh, let's see. Noah, <laughs> putting in the work to build the ark, to go through the flood. Paul and all his sufferings. Job and his immense sufferings. Man. Daniel and the lions. Moses in a bitter people. Saving the slaves. Dealing with Pharaoh and Egypt. I mean, it's astounding. So for me to sit up here and say that we have a greater advantage, I better do a pretty good job of explaining how that's true, right? <laughs> okay, so let's turn to John chapter 20. And we're going to be reading verses 26 through 29. Here's what it says. And after eight days, his, that's Jesus' disciples, were again within, and Thomas was with them. And this is after the resurrection. The doors having been locked, Jesus is coming and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Thereafter, he is saying to Thomas, Bring your finger here and perceive my hands and bring your hand and thrust it into my side. And do not be becoming unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now Jesus is saying to him, Seeing, this is the key that I want you to grasp, Seeing that you have seen me, you have believed. Happy are those who are not perceiving and believe. Thomas is often referred to as the doubting disciple. And in this case, we have a good picture of that. He's doubting that this is really Christ. And Jesus says, well, I'll prove it to you. You'll have empirical evidence. And I'm going to write this term up here because it's going to be very important to the talk. Another little, another little game we're going to play. Raise your hand if you believe in this room. No one's raising their hand. You don't believe in this room? I don't believe in this room. I hope everyone in here believes in this room. Why do you believe in it? Because we're in it. We're in it. We can see it. We can smell it. Right? We can touch it. Taste it if you wanted to. We, have, we, we can experience this room with all five of our senses, just like we can... Every one of us and you know each other and every other thing that we perceive in the world around us. Belief is most often in what we can actually perceive, what we can actually see with our own eyes, just as Christ did with Thomas in John chapter 20. But Jesus tells him here, seeing that you have seen me, you have believed, happy are those who are not perceiving or not seeing me and believe. This is where faith comes in. Now let's turn to Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, verse 1. Here we get a definition of exactly what faith is. Here's what it says. Now faith is an assumption of what is being expected a conviction concerning matters which are not being observed. For in this the elders were testified to, by faith we are apprehending the eons to adjust to a declaration of God, so that what is being observed has not come out of what is appearing. So here's the difference between mere belief and faith. Belief often is based on proof, on empirical evidence. Faith, then, involves belief, but 
most importantly, it's in what we cannot see or know for sure. Here's the key to understanding my talk today. All the great men of faith that we listed up here before, and I said that they were at a great disadvantage compared to us, here's why. Every single one of them had direct knowledge, proof of the existence of God. Can you think of any person on the list, male or female, who that wasn't true for? Anybody? This direct communion with God. Abraham, same thing. Adam, we didn't list him, but same thing. King David, didn't list him, but <coughs> same thing. Noah, same thing. Paul, the resurrected Christ, appeared to him in person, gave him his message. I'd like to think that if any of us in this room were chosen by God, as the Apostle Paul was, to herald the same message and told that we had to suffer for his sake, it wouldn't be easy, and it wasn't easy at all for Paul. But I think it'd be easier having witnessed the resurrected Christ right, right in front of our face. Yeah, I always say right. Paul has the advantage on us. He had an advantage in that sense, mm -hmm. but we're actually the ones with the advantage because we didn't perceive, right. and yet we still believe. And that's my point. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's turn now to Matthew 20, verse 16. Oh. Okay, now, this is Jesus speaking to Israel, but this is God's MO that we read here in this passage. This is how God always works through Scripture. And the part I want to point out is the end of the verse, a very popular line. He says, Thus shall the last be first, and the first be last. In Jesus' day, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious leaders were the first. They were the ones who said, We can see. And Jesus said, I came to take away sight from those who say they can see and to give it to those who can't. There's always this reversal, right, of the proud and the humble. And the humble are glorified, and the proud are humbled. That's God's MO. Always has been. Now, typically that involves unbelievers and believers. You know, the, the Pharisees weren't exactly a righteous bunch, right? They were a self-righteous bunch. But they were wrong. They were sinful. So usually when we see the example in Scripture, it's the faithful versus the unfaithful. But this still applies in our case with the great men of faith that I listed up here a little bit ago. We today, in our generation, are the last, aren't we? Yeah. The first would be, just like back in Jesus' time, the religious leaders, the first today and the most corrupt are our modern day Western Christianity religious leaders. Mm -hmm. They would be considered by the world to be the first. Mm -hmm. But to God, we're the first. We just haven't obtained that yet. And as the Ecclesia and the called out ones, we're told to come out from that. And I love, you know, when and Jim, both your guys talk so far, I mean, just railing on. Christianity and the religious system. What do you hear me real on? Yeah, I don't think I don't think there's anything more more important that that we could be doing. We have a battle that we're fighting. Yes. And our and our fighting is not against unbelievers of this world. Our battle is against the sovereignties and authorities and and principalities of the celestial realm that are manifesting themselves today in the religious leaders of the church system. Yes. But the good news is, we who are now last in the eyes of the world will be first, and our glory will surpass every single person who's ever existed next to Christ because our faith today is blind. We haven't perceived anything, have we? We have the Word of God, but we haven't had direct communion with God. 
Even the first century Christians had Paul. They had Peter, John, James. They had these great men who were not far removed from Christ after his death and resurrection, and they could preach, and they had a, a very clear understanding at the time of their language. We're at a great disadvantage in terms of our modern day understanding compared to even the early Christians in the first several centuries after Christ was on the earth. And thank God that we do. That gives us that gives us such an advantage. It does. It's just hard to think of it that way, though, because you know we we look up to these men. Um, somebody, um, I don't have my Old Testament with me, but I want someone to read Isaiah fifty-five, eight, and nine. If you've got an, an OT with you. Yeah. And while you're doing that, Isaiah what? Fifty-five. We have our resident reader, right? Yeah, yeah. Encouraging some participation anyway, you know, that's... Oh, yeah. this is good. Somebody doesn't want me turning to it. All right, 55, 8 and 9? 8 and 9, yep. <coughs> this is from Young's. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, an affirmation of Jehovah. For the high have the heavens been above the earth, so high have my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. Right. Okay, great. Just another passage to prove that God's ways are not our ways. And the paradigms that we exist in and that we think in are off are, are ninety nine percent of the time, if not a hundred, the complete opposite of what we would expect to be true. That's true. Yep. Okay. And I think that you, you have to understand Isaiah 55, in order to grasp the point of my lesson today, that we really are at this this great advantage because of our faith. Um, think about Gideon as an example. <laughs> he starts with this bigger army. God dwindles it down and down further and down further until what? I think two, 200, 300. 300. Yeah, we get to basically nothing. Started with 30,000 and ended up with 300. And here's the whole purpose. <laughs> So that God's glory and might will be exemplified through that. Now, God says 3,000 soldiers is, you know, that's not too unfair of a disadvantage. And if we dwindle it down further, we're still, that, that, that still isn't really going to prove a whole lot. Now down to 300 compared to this massive army. When we win, because my will will be done, <laughs> My glory is going to be obvious. No one would ever dare question it, right? And this, it's this work that God does through contrast, and it's all about him, right? It's all about proving his glory. And the coolest thing about it for us is that that's what he's using us to do. He's using us, folks, to prove his glory. It's still all about him. The neat thing is, we still get a personal blessing and prize in the end for it. We aren't doing all this hard work and suffering for nothing, are we? No. (laughs) Just like Paul said, I've run the good race, fought the good fight. I have a wreath of righteousness reserved for me, personally. And the same is true for all of us. Has anyone seen or read the Lord of the Rings series? Mm -hmm. When I was thinking about this lesson, this image came into my mind. Um, about our future and what we can expect. And so it's this big epic story about the struggle against good and evil. And the key players, now there are you know wizards and, um, and warriors and kings and all these great men of might throughout the story. And then the key players who really make the difference <coughs> are these humble little hobbits. Right? They're these tiny people with big feet. They're hairy. They eat all the time. I mean, the last person, you'd, and of course it's fiction, but it's, it's still a neat example of what I kind of perceive us seeing in the future. So at the end of the story, when good has conquered evil and the king has reclaimed his throne, everyone's bowing to the king, and then everyone, including the king, bows to the hobbits. Right? because they were the key players. 
the most humble of all are the most glorified and honored in the end. And that's what I see. Instead of thinking, man, I wish I would have been Paul. I wish I would have been Moses. This would have been a lot easier. I would have had no doubts. Paul would be the one thinking, man, I wish that I could have lived 2,000 years after Christ. And now, in reality, none of us at the end is going to look back and say, I wish I would have been so-and-so or had such-and-such because this is all God's perfect plan and everyone's going to realize how they perfectly fit into it. But hypothetically, you know, if you can make a choice, if God gave us that freedom, then any one of those men we listed before would be more envious of us than what we should be of them. Hey, Steve, can I interrupt for just yeah. one second? Sorry. Uh, okay, Hobbit Part 2. Not well. Good to go. Did he go? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so Hebrews 11, verse 13. And faith died all these, these being the people of faith mentioned throughout the chapter, um, not being requited with the promises, but perceiving them ahead and saluting them and avowing that they are strangers and expatriates on the earth. For those who are saying such things are disclosing that they are seeking for a country of their own. This goes back to the ambassadorship Jim was talking about. And if indeed they remembered that from which they came out, they might have had occasion to go back. Yet now they are craving a better, that is a celestial, home. Right? It's all about looking forward and, like Jim talked about, our expectation, our hope, everything relies on that and on resurrection. Mm, let's go to Romans 8, 19. <clears throat> okay. I love this verse. For the premonition of the creation is awaiting the unveiling of the sons of God. That's us. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Oh, I love it. Do you understand what that means? Celestial beings, angels, are eagerly awaiting our unveiling. That's the good ones. Us sitting. <laughs> us sitting on the Bema, the day of Christ, which Clyde talked about, I think, our last conference, <clears throat> and this awesome reward that we're going to have. And I want you to understand that when you're given that reward in the future, you're not going to look back at that moment and say, yeah, but I had to suffer so much. Yeah. You're going, in that instant, it will surpass all the suffering you have gone through in this life combined 10,000 times over. We need the suffering now in order to have that perception and that right. understanding. We need that contrast in order to appreciate what's coming down the road. Right? It's like someone who always takes vacations and has an easy life and an easy job. They're going to take vacations for granted. To them it's normal. But for someone who slaves away in a factory or a landscaping or masonry job, day in, day out, seven days a week for years, and finally is given a week or two vacation, that vacation is going to mean the world to that person. Right? Because they've had the contrast of having to work and struggle so hard for so long in order to get it. It's like being dirt poor your whole adult life, having next to nothing, scraping by, barely making ends meet. And, of course, this will never happen for any of us in here <laughs> because we're believers. We have to suffer. But... Then down the road, someone handing you a check for a billion dollars with no strings attached. When you get the billion dollar check, you're not going to say, oh, poor me, because I had to go through being poor for so long. That contrast is going to enable you to appreciate that, and you're never going to worry again. Right. At least not about any, anything financial. So here's the difference between the great men of faith I listed and us. All of them had belief, but their belief was based on this. It was based on empirical evidence. They had rock-solid proof. 
often direct communion to know that God existed. He is real. There's no question in their mind. They have proof of that. They also had faith, but their faith was only in God's promises for the future, which is important. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have to have faith in God's existence itself. And they had witnessed him keeping his promises. So they still had to have faith in the future, but our faith today is everything. It encompasses our past, our present, and our future. Because we didn't have the advantage that the guys before us had. So we're in a very blessed place of honor and of glory. And it's something that I want to make sure all of us are not taking lightly. And anytime you have the inclination to think back and say, you know, if only I would have been in Paul's shoes, boy, that, that would have been easier to believe. No, think to yourself, Paul would have maybe wanted to be in my shoes and been able to have faith in what's not perceived at all today instead of having that advantage that he had. Right. Any questions or comments? No. Steve, do you think the first and the last might also apply to the apostles being the first and us being the last? I mean, I know you applied it to contemporaries, mm -hmm. like the high priest being the first of that day and the apostles being the last. And in our era, the Billy Grahams and the Joel Osteens being the first and we're the last. But mm -hmm. do you think you would apply that also to us and them as far as us being ragtag band of believers in Paul's gang? Being a ragtag mm -hmm. band of believers? Yeah. That day? Yeah, I would say that if we had to use the terms first and last mm -hmm. just to just to give kind of a hierarchy of that structure we would be higher than the disciples and by the way um, all of the disciples and essentially I mean the biblical account shows us that the Jewish people as a whole tended to be very proof oriented they needed to see in order to believe and they were stubborn, you know. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me to think that today God has gifted us with belief, with not just belief, but belief in what's unseen, with true faith. It's a great blessing. It is. Thank you.